This is an interview uh, by Calvin Gower and John Ledoux for the Central Minnesota Historical Center. And today we're interviewing uh, C. Elmer Anderson, uh, the former governor of Minnesota. Uh, today is April 5th, 1978. Uh, okay, Mr. Anderson, would you tell us um, about your family background, uh, where your parents were born, and uh, what your father did for a living and so on, please. I think, I think we can just leave it there and we'll pick it up. My uh, parents came from a Swedish community in Finland. They were of Swedish descent. Came to Brainerd in, I think it was 1897 or 1898. Settled in Brainerd. And, uh, were, raised a family of nine children. I was the seventh of the nine, of the nine children. I was the youngest son. My father was a, well, he was a carpenter and a laborer. He worked in the tie plant here in NP shops. And he also worked in a, as a boilermaker's helper in the shops. And he died when I was 14. That was in 1926. Now, why did they come to Brainerd? They came to Brainerd because there was quite a group of, uh, of young people at that time that had come to Brainerd, and uh, I guess they followed them here. A group of young people from their home area? Yes. Yes. Oh. yes. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were Swedish, but living in what is now Finland? Yes. See, mm -hmm. Finland at one time was part of, of Sweden, and this was on right across the bay from Sweden. The Swedish name of the town at that time was was a, the name of Esse, Finland. And the uh, big town near the where they lived was Jakobstad, which was a town about the size of St. Cloud. Mm. And your parents were married in uh, Sweden? They were married in Brainerd. Oh, they were married in Brainerd? Yes. yes. They, they, after they came over here? Yes. Sure. My father, my father had a brother that and a sister living in Superior, Wisconsin. My mother had a sister living here in, in Brainerd, and my father also had a cousin living here in Brainerd. But they knew each other back there, too. I assume they did. I never did. Oh, I see. Uh, sure. And what year were they married then? I could check back on it. But no, that's okay. Was it about 1900 or 18? 1890. Uh, about 1897, I think. 1897. I have their marriage to be someplace, but I think Sure. Okay. And uh, you were born what day and year? March 16th, 1912. 1912. Okay. And you were the seventh in this family? That's right. No. Okay. And uh, you uh, have lived here in Brainerd all of your life then, except when you were off to St. Paul and so on? I still maintain a home here. I lived several years. I was in the banking business in, in uh, Nashville, Minnesota, but lived in Grand Rapids, and also I lived in, uh, in Buffalo Lake. And that was about a period of about four years oh. after, after serving as governor. Uh -huh. Sure, okay. And so you grew up here in Brainerd, uh, went to the public schools there and so on? Or? Yes, I, was, I graduated from the Brainerd High School in 1928. And I attended the local schools here. I spent, I went, was three years in uh, elementary grades here in Brainerd, and also I spent three years at the uh, St. Matthias uh, Rural School here, just south of Brainerd. Was this a. Our, uh, far, our, our folks had a farm too one time. We lived at the farm for a short time. Oh, then we moved back to Brainerd. Was this St. Matthias, was that a uh, parochial school of Swedish? No, that, no, no, that was a public school. And it was a predominantly French settlement. Mm. It was a there, were, there were only about three families there that uh, spoke English, and the rest of them were, spoke French. And at school, they, most of the youngsters spoke French. Mm. Mm -hmm. What it was the um, nationality or ethnic makeup of Brainerd in those years? When well, they were growing up. Well, there were a lot of uh, Swedish people, Finnish, Norwegian, Danish. German, French, quite a cross-section. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. 
Uh, it wasn't uh, distinctively uh, Scandinavian or German or no, something like no, this. No. It was predominantly, I imagine, most of the church, uh, predominantly Lutheran, but there was a large Catholic group here too. Are those people mostly German Catholics, or such as in no. St. Cloud? Or? No, there was German and Polish and French. Oh, mm -hmm. sure. Irish, a lot of Irish. Oh, so it was quite a, uh, quite many different groups represented here. Really. Definitely, very yeah. much. Oh, okay. sure. Uh, was uh, the, um, well, how big was Brainerd back then? Uh, years when you were a young boy? It was about 10,000. So the population of Brainerd hasn't varied too much. It's, it's surrounding areas that's grown. Oh, I Inside see. of the area that's yeah. grown. Okay. Okay, then what did you do after you graduated from high school? Well, I, I started to go to the University of Minnesota. I want, wanted to uh, take a medicine, but that was in 1929 and the Depression came on and I had to come back home for the work. I couldn't see my way clear to go to school. Mm -hmm. Financially, mm -hmm. I couldn't mm -hmm. go to school. That's sure. Right. Uh -huh. And what did you do then when you came back to Brandon? I returned and started working again for the man that I was worked for for some time in the magazine wholesale and newspaper distribution in northern Minnesota and central Minnesota. Oh, uh, and you'd worked for him before you uh, graduated from high school? Yes, I started out as a newspaper carrier and uh, I see. worked into the business. Oh, sure. What type of duties did you have in this business? Well, I eventually became manager, and upon his death I became the owner. And this is throughout northern Minnesota? Northern and central Minnesota, yes. Mm -hmm. When was this that you became the owner? That was when he died in December 1934, so it'd be 1935. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, when did you get started in politics? That was in 1937. Well, no, 1936, I think it was, when I became chairman of the Young Republicans here in Cohen County. That's how you started out, as the That's chairman right. of the Young Republicans? Yes. I became interested in Harold Stassen, was state chairman of the Republican Party at that time. And for young Republicans, and George Etchell was the 6th District chair, Chairman, and uh, started working with them. How did George Etchell spell his name? E-T-Z-E-L-L-L. -L -L. Okay. He's from Clarissa, and he was National Republican Committeeman for many years. Oh. And when I was governor, he was National Committeeman. Oh. Now, were you, uh, had you been interested in politics before that, or? Well, Yes, I was interested. I was followed it, but I just became interested. Was, was your family, was your father politically active? No, no, or? no, no. So there hadn't been anything in the background like no, that? It was no, just my own. Yeah, your own uh, interest sparked there in the middle of the 1930s. Okay, then, um, uh, what did you do? What was the next step there in your political career then? Well, in 1938, I filed for lieutenant governor. And that was when we had the open primaries. And there were three people that filed, and I was successful and got the nomination. Who were the other people that were running? Do you recall? A fellow by the name of George Johnson and uh, Russ Schweitzer. Russ Schweitzer. Okay. And you got the nomination, though, yeah. on the Republican ticket. And but I, had to, I had to wait to to the vote of the canvassing board for the official votes. Oh, it was a close election. There's was only a thousand votes out of uh, two, three hundred thousand, I forgot the figure. Oh, I see, sure. And Harold Stassen was the uh, gubernatorial yes. candidate then. And he was 31 and I was 26. Yeah, right. Okay. And, and, and Lawrence Hall was elected Speaker of the House in 1938. That 39th session, and he was 28. And he was from St. Cloud. That's right. Yeah. Did you um, did you know Stassen before? Well, you knew him as you, when you became chairman of the Young Republican yes, group. Yes, that that's when he became a. He was a Dakota County attorney at the time. Mm -hmm. You hadn't known him before that, though. No. no. Uh -huh. 
uh, what did you, were you involved very much in his campaign then in 1938? Oh yes, the young Republicans were very active in the, in the campaign. That's when Elmer Benson was governor and it was quite a appeal in state politics. He had succeeded Floyd Olson and there was a mood for a change and that's why the young Republicans were interested in the young people were interested in changing the political system. What <coughs> what were some of the issues of that campaign, as you recall? Oh, p political patronage and. You know. Was Ben was Benson pretty much the issue? Well, Benson was. He was pretty pretty radical at the time. At that time, but, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, sometimes some of the things he stood for are now were adopted. But uh, but he was pretty radical. Was you know, the political system, political pattern was set up, and the people just said they had enough of the change. Because they had been in power for some time, and the pendulum swung the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, now, was this um, campaign a campaign that involved, well, let's see how I can word this. Was, was there quite an independent element involved in here? as well as the regular Republican Party people there? Working yes. for Stassen? Yes, I think uh, the independent group were behind Stassen. He had an all-party committee supported him. And the conservative party, the uh, conservative end of the party were backing Martin Nelson, who was, had been a nominee two years before that. Hmm. And, uh, later on, I went to the, to the Supreme Court. Oh. The reason I brought, you know, we've interviewed uh, Fred Hughes, yes, and that was the impression I got from him that the uh, there was quite a uh, bit of activity that was sort of outside of the regular channel of the party. Yes, yeah. and most of that group were supporting the Harold Stassen. Yes, and the that's what group, I meant. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, oh, Fred I Hughes. Mean. Fred Hughes was was part of it when I became active. He was on the Young Republican group too. Yeah, so. right. Uh huh. Okay, so then you became lieutenant governor in 1930. Uh, Back in 38, you became 39. Took over in 1939. Okay, and uh, you had never been in any public office before that. No, I never presided over a meeting. I had to yeah. preside over the state senate. <laughs> yeah, how did you? How did that go with you there? Did you pick that up pretty quickly and so on? Yeah, so I studied the rules and, and uh, I had the advice. Uh, Support of the leaders and listen to them until you know, I caught on. And it was very easy. And the Republicans controlled both houses of the legislature. Well, it wasn't. It was conservatives. It yeah, was, it was not the time, then. but, but uh, they weren't considered Republicans. But no, but that, that, that it was the conservative. conservative group, though. That's right. Yeah, a group called conservatives. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and um, then you ran for office again in 1940. Lieutenant Governor? Yes, and I was re-elected. And then in 1942 you did not run again? Was that I right? ran, and, uh, but Harold Stassen uh, announced that he was going to resign, accept a commission in the Navy, and he supported Ed Thai to run for Lieutenant Governor. And we, had, we had quite a bitter battle, but Ed Thai won. This yeah. was in the primary then? Yes. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what was there, uh, was this a political matter here that uh, brought, uh, brought about uh, Thais being pushed by Stassen? Was there a difference between you and Stassen politically somewhat? Or well, not, you not so much, what? but he felt that, uh, I don't know how, what he felt, but anyway, he wanted that Thai. Was Thai older than yes, you? Yes, considerably older, yes. He was so about 50, I think. Might have been an age factor. Could know? have been there. Yeah. I was only thirty at the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, the uh, and was Thai from Dakota County also? Yes, he was a farmer in Dakota County. He was commissioner of agriculture at the time. So they'd known each other maybe somewhat before that too. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. They worked together in Dakota County politics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then uh, you were out of politics for a bit there. Two then? two years. Because and then, then when when uh, 
because I ran for governor, I was still I ran again for lieutenant governor, and I was elected. Mm. So I served under my lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. Sure. This was uh, beginning in uh, 1945 mm -hmm. that you took over. Yeah, election of 44. Election mm -hmm. of 44. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you were lieutenant governor for the rest of the time until uh, 19. But we elected governor in 1952, was that it? See, Ed Thai uh, ran for office in 44, well, 44, and in 46, he ran for the uh, state senate. Or the United S States United Senate. United States Senate. Henry Shipston. He was elected. In 1946? Yes. Oh, uh-huh. So in 1948, uh, when was uh, Young Doll elected for the first time? Uh, 1946. Young doll. Yes. Because uh, Thai had decided to run for the Senate. That's right. Against Shipstead. Yeah. And I was and then I ran, still continued to run for Lieutenant Governor under Young Doll. Uh -huh. and he, he was elected in 46 and 48 and 50. And then in September 27th, 1951, he resigned to become federal judge in Washington and then I became governor. You took over as governor. That's right. Sure. Okay. And then uh, you okay. were elected as governor in 1952. That's right. Okay. Uh, what, uh, what did you think were some of the most important matters that you were concerned with during these years in politics when you were lieutenant governor? Any, anything that sticks out in your mind there? Well, the... Uh, one of the main issues at the time was, was uh, developing of our mental health situation, improving our institutions. Mm -hmm. But as I look back, the things were kind of quiet at that time as compared to today. Politics mm -hmm. or administration. Yeah. And the budget wasn't as great as it is today. Did the uh, Conservatives control the legislature all the time for years? Yes, yes they do. Mm -hmm. So there would be quite a bit of cooperation between the governor and the legislature? Well, there was, but we, we had our problems. And not only I, but uh, Governor Thai, Young Dog, Stassen. I think we were all more liberal in, as far as money matters are concerned, we had more programs than the, the conservative legislature wanted to give us sure. the funds to operate. Uh, when by and large, we got along pretty good. Uh -huh. Now, when you ran for governor in 1952, um, did you have some opposition? In the, was it in a primary situation again then that you had to get the nomination? Or? 1952, yes. Uh, Seth King, a longtime auditor, oh. ran against me. Oh, yeah. But. Uh, in primaries, I carried every county but one. It was Hubbard County. Oh. Right. Every county in the state except one. We got, uh, Staff King was one of our top vote getters mm. until that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, who was your uh, position in the general election? 1952? Yeah. Orville Freeman. Orville Freeman. Okay. Now, Freeman had just uh, sort of uh, come into the political arena, what, in the late 1940s there? Yes, sir. he was a young Democratic party. He was chairman of the DFL so party at the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. Was he holding any office at the time? No, he no, no, he was just a party worker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did that election go there in 1952? Mm -hmm. Well, I won by a landslide. I received one of the largest votes uh, and stood up. Stood up for about 25 years. Oh. 
1952. Now this was uh, tied in with Eisenhower's running for president that year, so on, too? Or did you yes, uh, Eisenhower ran at that time, although I received just a few more votes than Eisenhower, about a thousand more votes than Eisenhower received. You're in the so Yes. Uh, you're, um, you think that your support was because you'd been in the office for all those years and you were pretty well known throughout Minnesota and so on there? Or how would you account for that landslide the victory? Well, I would, I would hope to think that people thought I was doing a good job. Uh huh, sure. And, uh, the history of the Minnesota politics is that lieutenant governors who have succeeded the governorship. At the time they run for re-election, they're always re-elected. Oh, is that right? That's yeah. happened every time? Yes. Oh, so Perpich supposedly should have a pretty good chance. Well, history Historically. Goes, historically, yes. Oh, I see. I didn't realize that. Hmm. Okay, then when you were governor, uh, that was for the one term, right? I served an unexpired term of... Uh, yeah, that's again, right, sure. Which was almost yeah. two years. And then elected in right, right, two years. Yes. Uh, was there any? Were there any um, real uh, significant things, that, issues, and so on that stood out in your mind for the most years? Or was it a fairly uh, well? You were recall quiet during the Eisenhower time. years. It was uh, government or state government, federal government, or. operating on a pretty, uh, well, shall we say, smooth, mm -hmm. very smooth, and there wasn't the controversy that there mm -hmm. was today. No. So, outside of the financial matters, and adoption of the budget, budget getting the amount of money that the governor or president wanted, and things were going on pretty smoothly. So, yeah. I had, I had just one question uh, here concerning uh, your term as governor. During those years, there was quite an emphasis on loyalty oaths, on checking on personnel in government. As governor, did you uh, get any pressure? Uh, you felt like you were under the obligation to uh, put uh, more scrutiny on state employees? No, we didn't have that here in Minnesota. There, there's no, no uh, mood of that at all? No, 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 no. Uh, In uh, the um, election there of 1938, one of the charges against Benson was that he was linked to communists. Is that right? That was... Uh, Use the term broadly, I guess. Yeah, that, that, could be that was a charge yes. that was made anyway. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, when you get into the 1950s, this was not an issue in Minnesota. No, I think so everything was elaborated on the, out of proportion than it really was. Sure, yeah. Uh -huh. um, the, um, this was more of a national issue, and then maybe, maybe in some states it might have been played up more. But not here in Minnesota. Especially in Wisconsin. Well, yeah, yes. right, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, incidentally, it seems to me that uh, Mr. Hughes, Fred Hughes, it seems to me that I recall he was saying that there was a certain individual, I can't remember the name of that person now, who Hughes thought was a, a very likely person to be a um, candidate for governor, but this person was Jewish. And uh, Mr. Hughes felt that there was a certain amount of anti-Semitism in Minnesota. This was in the last part of, the, uh, I guess, in the early 1940s. And therefore, this man was not uh, given uh, support. Does that ring any bell with you? It doesn't ring any bell with me. Oh, I see. Okay, now then, um, in 1954, you ran against Orville Freeman uh, for governor again, is that... Uh, That's right. Yes. Uh, okay, and um, 
uh, this time Freeman won the election. Yes. Is that right? In 1954. What, um, what, how do you account for that turnabout there? Well, I think there was a Democratic trend in this whole area throughout, throughout the country. Uh, Minnesota, Arkansas, Dakota. It's one of those things that happens every so often. And that's what happened. Did you, uh, was your campaign any different in 1954 than it had in 52? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't think it's too much different. But what about the DFL campaign? Was it any different in 54 than two years before? Oh, yes, they, they made uh, a lot of political charges, which true, but Miles Lord was one of the private attorney general. He made a lot of charges and so forth and so on. Made them sound worse than they were. How was the, uh, what was the margin there of victory for Freeman? Not, not forgotten the figures, but it wasn't, it was just a few percentage points. Oh, it was Quite close yes, uh, yes. compared to the yeah. two years before there. But there wasn't the turnout of voters at that time until the time before. Oh, is that right? No. The number of voters was down quite a bit. Yes. Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize that campaign against Freeman as you remember it? Was You mentioned there were political charges that were leveled against your administration. Would you, uh, how would you characterize their campaign? Was it one of leveling charges which you said were largely unfounded or was it there were, were there certain issues that were very prominent that took precedence? Well, it was a typical campaign of those outs against those who are in. And, you know, it's just part of the game. You know, make a lot of statements and pledge certain things. How did you feel about that campaign? Were you, uh, did you feel sort of uh, a little bit bitter about the way the campaign was carried on by the opposition? Well, I, no. I've been in politics for quite a while and it just goes with the, with the game. But I didn't know, I didn't feel bitter. It was kind of hard to take the defeat. But, yeah, that's uh, the way but, it was. Uh, but after my defeat, I cooperated with Freeman and I appointed the, yeah, I appointed his man and, he, he suggested Hart after on the Commission of Administration right immediately after he was I was defeated, so he could nearly start on the mm. running the state government. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, I had one other question regarding campaigning. Uh, from your experience as running uh, as lieutenant governor and governor, uh, what contrast would you draw to campaigning then and campaigning in the seventies, from what you've observed? Well, then it was pretty much each man was on his own. Everything, everything both parties, a man on your own. It was a question. Of, and you were, they were, they were, and the Republicans didn't endorse anybody. You heard the person was on his own. It was up to him to get his own volunteer committee and mm. votes. Mm. Now, pretty much a party structure, they endorse the candidates at the precinct, the county, and state level. Whoever gets endorsement, that's the end of their candidate. Yes. In those days, it was the open primary of both mm -hmm. parties. Do you see the, uh, the media as being one of the factors in modern-day campaigning? Oh, definitely. See, when, when I ran the, the governor in 54, that's when the TV was just becoming in. Mm -hmm. and when she came over on TV, it had a great effect on you. I think that affected the campaign a lot too. Did you make any TV uh, spots? I, I, made, I made quite a few. But of course, Freeman, his war record, uh, yeah, and, and Lord, they put on a very effective uh, TV campaign. I think that had a lot to do with it. We hadn't become familiar with the technique of campaign mm -hmm. totally. It's entirely different. A candidate. Nowadays, has to come over a bit on the TV and be a, have that charisma that comes over on TV. It does sway a lot of voters. Mm -hmm.
did you travel? Did, how did you did you like to campaign? Did you like campaigning? Well, I like to get around. Yes, mm -hmm. but I wasn't the typical political orator. Never claimed to be. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the reasons. I perhaps was defeated too. Mm, you know, we've run into. Uh, We've interviewed mostly it's been legislators, or oh, yes, sure. but we run into some people who said they just don't like campaigning at all. That's the worst part of it for them. And, um, no, it's not easy. But yeah, that's what they say. It's a difficult. Uh, whereas then we've run into others who said they really enjoyed that uh, getting around. And so well, I enjoy. I used to enjoy going around meeting with people, personal personal contact, rather than the the necessary radio and TV page yeah. that you had to meet. That's, yeah. that's rather difficult for someone who isn't, isn't a clip speaker. Sure. Do right. you think it's becoming a little bit more depersonalized as far as you're not making as much personal contact, you're doing it through a medium or something? Yeah, that's right. Now, now, nowadays you see the candidates going from going by airplane from one TV station to another and make a mm -hmm. press conference and, and, and the images get over coming, come, comes over TV, that's very important today. John, how's that tape doing there? Maybe have one more question, then before we should switch it over. Okay. Uh, did you, uh, have you run for off political office other than mayor of uh, Brainerd since 1954? Well, then when, I came, then when I came back after uh, 1955, I think it was either 56 or 57, uh, or the 58, the, uh, I lived at Nisswa at the time, and the people in Nisswa wrote me in as uh, mayor, mm. I, and I served two terms there as mayor of Nisswa. Oh, uh-huh, sure. And then, but you did not run for state board office again? Uh, oh, yes, uh, yes, I, in 19, I'm trying to get my date straight here, 56 I ran for secretary of state. Oh. You know, against uh, uh, Joe. This tape will be continued on the other side. You ran for Secretary of State in 1956. Six against Joe Donovan. Yes. And Donovan won the election. Yes. He was running for re election. He had been elected in 1954, along with mm -hmm. Freeman. Mm -hmm. Now, did you play any part in uh, any of these campaigns later, like with uh, Elmer Anderson or uh, Harold Vander or any of those Republican? Well, very little. I oh. attend the party function and everything, but I haven't been too active in party politics since then. Oh, you haven't been? Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, but you were the mayor of Nisswa, you said, for, for two terms. Two yeah. terms. And then, uh, now you live here in Brainerd now, is that yeah. it? See, then I sold our place at the lake and went into the banking business and uh, was gone for uh, this area for four years and I come back and moved to Brainerd. Mm -hmm. This was 1969. 1969. And then uh, when did you start in as mayor of Brainerd? That was uh, two years ago. Last, uh, just like the last December my second term. Oh, I see. Okay. What, uh, how did you get started as being uh, involved in becoming mayor of Brainerd? Did some people come and talk to you and ask you to run for it and so on? Or well, several people suggested it to me and uh, I feel, I felt pretty, uh, well, how should, I, how should I put this? I think a lot of uh, Brainerd, right? Folks came here, immigrant parents, 1897, and I felt uh, this community done a lot for me, and I'd like to serve as a mayor. Did you have opposition in those races, both? Uh, the first one, uh, one of the one of the, uh, one of the aldermen had announced uh, that he was going to run before he knew that I was going to run. He continued the race, but I defeated you quite heavily. Mm. And then you had no opposition in uh, December? No, no filed against me. Uh, now you've had these uh, uh, 
uh, at least one very controversial issue here, this fluoridation issue. Uh, were you involved in this before you No, I wasn't came before. Here? No, I wasn't before, but that has been a burning issue here for the last 20, 25 years. Yeah, right. And it's a question of home rule. People felt that they should have the title of the option, but they, they had voted several times not to have it, and just got to be an issue with them. But oh. not, they weren't arguing whether the merits of fluoride are one way or the other, but they just felt that the community should be entitled to the preference. If they voted against it, they should be entitled to not have it. How does that stand right now? What's the situation now? Well, the last session, not this session, but the uh, year ago, the closing days of the session, they authorized the commission to be appointed to study the effects of fluoridation in water. The governor purposely just appointed a commission to study that and report back to the next session of the legislature. In the meantime, Brainerd didn't have to put fluoride in the water. What had before that uh, commission, the bill was passed setting up the commission, then there had been some court rulings that said Brainerd would have to start at a certain time? Was that it? That's right, David. Yeah, but the we deadline had court. not been reached. No. Oh, okay. So it's still Brainerd uh, has not had to uh, uh, get any fluoridation at any time there. Then. No, they fought the legally. They used every means they could legally mm -hmm. to stop it. And so court, through the courts, and yeah. so far we've been successful. Uh -huh. Okay. And when is this? Is there a deadline on this commission for its report? There is a report, I think, in the March of next year. I think in the session of the legislature. March 1979. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Was that bill uh, the work of uh, Borden and uh, Samuelson? Samuelson. Mm -hmm. Was through their efforts that this uh, that this commission was set up. Oh. And, uh, they, they, they deserve all the credit for it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they got it passed because of their friendships with their fellow legislature, uh, legislators. Yeah, right. Okay, then what was this we read in the newspapers about some uh, play, nightclub here or something? And what was, I don't know whether that was all uh, distorted in the newspapers, newspaper account. Did well, you vetoed some bill? Was that a nudity ordinance, which was patterned after the St. Paul ordinance which was supposed to prohibit, uh, it was very explicit. And the Brainerd Dispatch announced that they would not uh, publish it. And, uh, and their legal, uh, Brainerd Dispatch is their legal newspaper, and they would not publish the ordinance if it were, if it were passed. And I said that I would not lend my name to it under those circumstances. If it could not be published? I, yes. Oh, I see. And then I also said that it would create more problems than Saw because that's what's happening in St. Paul, and, and, you know, I, and I thought that Brainerd should wait to see how the St. Paul ordinance would, would work out. It uh, would create more problems than Saul you know, legally, you know, being embroiled in one battle after another. Now, was that passed by the City Council of Brainerd then? It was passed by the City Council of Brainerd. I vetoed it, and, uh, and, and, and they sustained my veto. Oh, they sustained your veto. We have seven council, council members of the council, and they needed five votes uh, out of the seven. But they only got four out of the seven. Oh. Three, three voted to sustain me. So. Oh, yeah. Well, did you get uh, very much criticism because of this uh, stand? Or? Oh, yes, I got criticism from a large militant group. Uh, but uh, by and large, I think the citizens approved of my action. Was, was, was yeah. this uh, was this bill? Is that what you call it? A ordinance. bill? Ordinance. ordinance. Was this ordinance uh, brought about because of this militant group? Do you think primarily? Or? There's a certain militant group in town. No. Oh. Yeah. But you don't uh, feel that the uh, uh, you feel that the Majority of people supported you on that, probably. On the basis that, that I, uh, I vetoed it, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because as I said, it would create more problems than it would solve. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Okay. Even though I don't approve the place. So. Is that place right in Brainerd, or is it's it right down the street about a block from here? Oh, it's, so it's right it's in. Been downtown. operating now for 10, 15 years. Oh, I didn't. Know that. And if you, if the place has been operating and you decide to put it out of business, you better be stand on pretty firm legal grounds, and that's was, was my what point. Was it operating in the same way all through that yes, period? Yes. Oh, I see. I didn't realize that. I thought it had just started. Okay, uh, you have a two-year term as mayor, is that it? Two-year term, yes. Yeah. And uh, you might be interested in running again then, uh, two years Well, we'll look at that two years yeah. from now. Okay. John, what else do you have? Anything else there? Um, backtracking, I don't believe we asked uh, about when you were married. No, we didn't ask that at okay, all. Okay, uh, when were you married? Uh, how did you meet your wife, first of all? Well, we were married in... 1937, 41 years ago, April. Yeah, we'll be celebrating that 45th anniversary, 41st anniversary, April 10th. Mm -hmm. Well, she was a girl that I met here in Brainerd. She was, she worked in Brainerd, and then later on she worked for me for a while too. So, been acquainted in that way. You have how many children? We have three children. Three children. Girls and son. Okay. Um, do you think there have been any uh, big changes in Brainerd throughout the years that you've been here? Well, maybe it's a coincidence, but uh, but I'm very pleased that uh, since I've been mayor, not entirely through my efforts, but through my efforts. A lot of people in the political scene. Brainerd has made great strides in the last few years. We remodeled our downtown area. Uh, a few trees in downtown and generally improved the downtown area with new sidewalks and new sewers and so forth, new lighting to make it much more attractive. And just now, we, uh, just the other day, we uh, led a contract for a new Laurel Street Bridge, which has been in existence since 1898, which have a great influence on our writer. Two million dollar bridge. And we'd also just last year, we were successful in obtaining a new uh, housing unit for the elderly, 143 units. Uh, the end of the Sloral Street Bridge. What is, how do you spell that name? Sloral. Laurel Street. Laurel. Laurel. L-A-U-R-E-L. Yeah, that's Laurel. the main street of Brainerd. Oh. It's been the historic street in Brainerd for years, oh. well, ever since Brainerd was established. Okay. And then we're also April 13th, we're going to let bids for a joint uh, Crowing County and City of Brainerd public safety building, which and, and jail, which will amount to a, a building about we hope the contract to be left for around two million dollars. I mean, that's the that's the estimated cost. And then we're going to, and then if that's successful, then we're going to that's the bill, which I assume it will be. The old jail will be made a historical society museum. So that's something we wanted. Then uh, there's prospects now. In the mill, and I'm sure it's going to materialize. That's a multi million dollar in another shopping center right on the edge of Baxter, Brainerd, a half of it. So about a third of it will be in Brainerd, two thirds in, in Baxter. But this is this area is growing, and the state demographer says it's the fastest growing area in this part of the state. And a lot of people are coming up to Brainerd to retire. You can go around the lakes, you can see the beautiful homes that are being built. So everything's on the upswing as far as Brainerd is concerned. We are, uh, we, for years we had trouble getting new doctors here. Now our medical center is developing. We've got quite a number of specialists here. And so Brainerd has been designated by the federal government as the regional medical center. So. Everything looks good for the future of Brainerd. 
We have a new school, we have a good school system, beautiful athletic field. So people are, are coming to this area, I believe, because if you get a young person coming up here, they're interested in schools. Well, we have a fine school system. We have a community college, an education school. And then if you're older and you want to come up here to retire, we've got all the lakes and the lake area and all the hobbies that you might have. Any hobbies you might want to. We have fishing, golf, anything. And, uh, and if you're older and you're looking for a home, we'll become established in this. In, in a certain area, you want to know what the medical facilities are. And certainly, we're, in, we're getting some of the best in the state. So, I'm very optimistic, as I've often said, I'm very bullish on the, on the growth of this area. And it's, it's certainly, it's a pleasure for me to serve as a mayor at this time when this growth is going on and brighter. Like I reported to council the other day, I think this might next year and the year after, we're going to have one of the largest. Building uh, building booms that we've had in you know, I believe in its history, hmm. so things are looking good here. Now, yeah. now I'm speaking like a, as a, as a mayor. <laughs> <speak chat. laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, that sounds fine. Yeah. Did, did Brainerd uh, was it sort of static for many years? It has been, but just lately it's been taking off. Yeah. Yeah. It, all, it was always fairly healthy town and so on, I would think, but it's just that it didn't grow a lot. It didn't expand a lot. To, yeah. Throughout many years, our paper mill is, is growing. We just uh, authorized a million dollars in industrial bonds just to help them uh, get some new equipment here. Mm. See, they're, they're, it's owned by the Potlash people, and they have a plant, and, and their main plant is in, in Cloquet. Oh. But they finished, they send their products here, and it's finished here in, in the greater. Oh. So it's, uh, they're our largest employer. And we have the shops, and now they're made into a Reclamation center for the whole border to northern. So, so that's that's looks good. Mm -hmm. So the industry is growing. Might get back to the our downtown area here. It, when they're planting trees, uh, I suggested that they plant the Norway pine. So they have a sentimental attachment to North, mm -hmm. Norway pine because that. When I was in 1952 session, or 53 session, that was made the official state tree. And I had the honor of signing the Norway Pine as official state tree, so it's kind of, kind of a, what should I say? I was, I was glad to see that the state, or the city, planted the pine as official tree. As much as I was one that mm -hmm. signed it into law, making it a state tree. Mm -hmm. Not just an interesting site. Sure, right. Yeah. Okay. John, you got anything else? I just had a couple other questions. <coughs> Looking back to your years both as lieutenant governor and governor, what do you recall as being the parts of the jobs that you enjoyed and which parts did you not enjoy as both lieutenant governor and governor? Well, Lieutenant Governor was a very uh, pleasant experience. When I was Lieutenant Governor, and it, it, uh, the main duties of the uh, Lieutenant Governor was to preside over the State Senate. And, uh, and the only uh, thing you did for any duties that you performed were at the request of the Governor. Whatever he doesn't need you to do, you do. You represent him or what, what, what have you. So you were able to be next in command, but you didn't have any responsibilities. And socially, it was very pleasant. And very pleasant presiding over the state senate and meeting all the senators. But uh, didn't have responsibility. In that sense, it was a very, very, very pleasant job. Being governor, of course, it was a big responsibility. It isn't the day-to-day -day work that was so much involved in person, but the, the fact that you can never escape the responsibility. You knew that 
you were there and something did happen, you were there. But that always, you always had that thought in the back of your mind and responsibility was on your shoulder. And, uh, but I suppose the most difficult job or the only thing that was pleasant was your budget hearing when you had to listen to all the requests from all the institutions and go over them and there was enough money to go around so you had to say no so many more times than you you'd rather say yes but the money just goes so far were you uh, or were there any of these leaders that you you thought were especially outstanding, like uh, Harold Stassen or Luther Youngdahl, these people that you worked with? Well, I think, uh, I don't know what uh, uh, comparisons, but I would say Harold Stassen was, was an exceptional leader. And I think he had the qualifications to become president. And I think he would have become president if he'd have stayed around in Minnesota and probably run for senator or something like that. But he he was a great administrator. But was too anxious to run for president probably and ran too soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have another question? Yeah. <coughs> How do you how do you see the governorship? Do you see it as having changed over the years from the years you were governor? Well, it's changed very much. Before it used to be uh, <coughs> more so than it is now. It used to be a position of honor. And, and it still is, of course, but now there's lots of work to go with it. All these uh, much detail. The government has become so complex, there's so much paperwork that just, just gets you down. I see Perfect just trying to do away with some of the paperwork. More power to them, but it's difficult to do with all your federal regulations. Federal government has more and more regulations that the state has to live up to, the county, the state, or the city. So it's much more difficult now. It just now it's just a lot of hard work. When, uh, when do you think this started, this trend towards more difficulties? It was well, after you were governor, I think, yes, it, I started, uh, oh, I think maybe about, about six to eight years after I became in, uh, ten years maybe after I became, was governor. Oh, uh-huh. It gradually got more and more dependent on the federal government and all the regulations. And, uh, No, I have no questions left. Okay. Is, it Is there anything that we haven't asked that you wanted to get into yeah. regarding your career or your background? Mm -hmm. No, uh, other than it's uh, been a great honor for me pleasure for to serve as governor. That's one of the few, not very many, many men in the history of this state receive this honor. It's not to be taken light, lightly. Uh, I appreciate it. I feel very humble that the citizens of the state saw fit to elect to pick the main governor. Because it's been a great experience and it's certainly didn't leave me a wealthy man, but I wouldn't trade all the wealth in the world for the experience and, and the friendships and the people that I got to know. And have a chance to see this, this is a state, a great state it is. It is a great state. It's, it's a mixture of all nationalities. And that's what's made it great. Uh, I think that's true with any community too. I think a community that's a mixture of nationalities, uh, different religious groups, 
it's a much better and much stronger community than one that's strictly dominated by one group or the other. Well, kind of rambling here. I hope uh, no, you're that's something. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, this uh, this concludes this interview.